right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today, I am delighted to be joined from Toronto in Canada by Vanessa Udelman. How are you doing, Vanessa? I'm great, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and Vanessa is the president of Mosaic People Development, a leadership facilitator and coach for over 20 years and an author of a book about leaders, leadership. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the game changer, a new kind of leader for a new world of work. So let's face it, Vanessa, like the world of work was changing dramatically anyway, pre-COVID. Now it's changed even more. So we have so many different uh, constructs for work. Now you can have yeah. like people in physical buildings, they can be virtual, they can be a hybrid mix. You can a lot more contractors who are long-term contractors now. So you don't always have full-time employees. You have so many different constructs mm -hmm. uh, now that it's a different world leading when you have, when you have so many pieces and, and so many changes, if you like. Oh yeah, it's so true. I mean, I really think that never before has it been this difficult for leaders. Yeah, I know. I I would I would totally agree. I mean, I think the, the difficult for leaders and this is this is pioneering stuff, right? I mean, there's no there's no guidebook right now to say how do you manage in a world like this going forward. So, from your point of view, what are some of the things that leaders need to do now in order to put themselves in the best place possible to to deal with this new reality? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> it's it is a challenging time, and I believe that organizations are even asking more of leaders than they ever have before. So when I work with a group of leaders, whether it's training or coaching, we always start with self-awareness because, mm. you know, I actually have three pillars that I focus on when I work with leaders. One is in this day, this, this time where um, there has been so much upheaval, the first pillar is know yourself. The second pillar is manage your team. And the third is lead your business. And, and lead your business means something different now than it did two years ago. Um, so I like to start with that, know yourself. I think if you can really understand what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what you bring to the table in terms of leadership and find your own authentic leadership style, that is more important now than ever before. Yeah, I, I I would totally I would totally agree with that, and I would say self awareness anyway. I've always said I think safe, self awareness is the key to success in the long run. Unfortunately, a lot of us go through our our journey of self discovery um, maybe later than we should. But uh, you know, that's always been my advice to people: is become self aware as soon as you can, even if it's an uncomfortable process, because it's the gateway to success. Yeah, and it's true. I think so many leaders are what I call unconscious leaders. So they mm -hmm. go through their day, they have no sense of how their behavior is impacting themselves or how their emotions are impacting themselves and other people. That's emotional intelligence, how their behavior impacts the people around them. Um, you know, I read an interesting quote recently about the fact that your level of stress is more impacted by your manager than, you know, anyone else in your life. And so mm. it really is a, it, it's a very, it's a big responsibility to take on a leadership role. And I think sometimes people do it for the wrong reasons. And I think that's part of leading in this new world of work is you have to really care. You have to care about your people. You have to want to um, take the time to coach and take the time to develop. And one of the problems that I see in the workplace consistently is that people get promoted into leadership roles because they're good at their job. They're good at what they did before, right? So let's say you're an engineer and then you are really good at, at um, at your job, um, um, whether you're a mechanical engineer or a technical engineer, or whatever it is that you focus on, then you get promoted. Now you're leading other mechanical engineers. That's a different job. Uh, yes. You didn't study that at university, mm -hmm. right? It's actually a different job. And a lot of organizations don't give people the skills and tools they need to do that job. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I think it's the majority, quite frankly. I think most people, yeah. because they, you know, they just promote people. Oh, you're a team leader. Oh, now you're a manager. Now you're this. And and never, yes. and never uh, teach any skills. And one of the things that you mentioned at the beginning, which I would absolutely 100% un, un, underline, and we believe in it here, is that, the first, the first role of a manager slash leader is to manage and lead themselves. 
And if you can't do that, you can't do, you can't uh, help other people. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hundred percent true. And a lot of leaders also, they, when they think about leading themselves, they look at leaders around them who also haven't had the training, yeah. right? And they emulate their behavior. And I think that's part of the new world of work right now is really thinking about what makes you tick, right? Don't emulate someone, for example, who's a different work style than you. If you're someone who's highly introverted and you're trying to emulate someone who's highly extroverted, it's not <laughs> going to feel like a good fit for you, right? And you know, often I use some self-assessments. I don't know if you know the DISC profile, that's yeah. an assessment, for example. I love the DISC. And, uh, you know, I've seen every leader um, with every work style possible, whether they're introverts or extroverts or task-oriented or relationship-oriented, and people say to me, like, okay, Vanessa, so what's the best style for a leader? And I always say, your style. You mm -hmm. have to be the best. That's part of that know yourself pillar, right? You have to be the best version of yourself. And what that means is, there's some things you need to dial up and some things you need to dial down. That's how I keep people in the zone of being authentic, right? I don't say change who you are, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say you're someone who's really direct. Okay, that's good. Like there's a lot of good things about being direct. People know what you're thinking and feeling, right? You're very clear on expectations. But what you probably notice is that people who are overly direct can come across maybe as a little rude. And so that would be an example of, where you need to dial down your directness and maybe dial up something like your listening or your patience. Yeah, and and I think one of the one of the parts of this too is if we if we go back, right? You, you turn the turn the clock back. Once upon a time, there was only one real way of communicating, right? So you know, the leader like spoke to the organization, or when an email came along, you sent out emails to the organization. Now there are so many different ways of communicating, yeah. and I think not only are there so many ways of communicating, people now have preferred ways of receiving information. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a huge challenge for leaders is that they can't just communicate in the same way to every, there's no just one blanket communication. You have to kind of start segmenting your audience if you like. Yeah, and you have to understand that people are wired differently than you are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did a, a change management session with a group of leaders last week and it was really interesting because we talked about the fact that 70% of change initiatives fail. And one of the reasons is because, well, first of all, change is really hard. It's very expensive, <laughs> you know, but one of the reasons also is that it's just not communicated well. Mm -hmm. And so I asked them, I'm wondering what you think about this. How many times do you think you need to communicate a message to somebody before it really sinks in and they can integrate it? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, like what, 10? <laughs> Yeah, like six to seven times. I think mm -hmm. 10 is probably even more accurate, but the research <laughs> says six or seven times, right? So I went through this communication strategy with this group of leaders because that's part of the new world of work. You have to be able to lead and manage change and communicate change. So mm -hmm. we did a list of like six or seven different ways you can communicate thinking about different work styles, right? And the first one, we, I was joking around with this group because I said, what typically happens is the first one is the email right? And it's a very cra carefully crafted email and lots of people touch the email and read the email and change the email. And then the email goes out. And I would say maybe 20 to 40% of the of people who receive the email actually read it. And then the mm. leaders who are implementing the change go, all right, change is implemented, go. Well, that's only one. Now you've got seven more times to communicate or six more times to communicate to individuals, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that's and and I think that's also the challenge of the way. I mean, we have somebody told me we have like five generations. We have the most generations in the workplace now ever. Yeah. Uh, and and obviously there's a there's 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 a lot of similarities. There's a lot of differences. And and I think one of the challenge for for leaders now, especially maybe leaders who've been in leadership positions for a while, is I think this is a part they struggle with, especially when you have these kind of newer people who want to be informed they want to give their opinion on everything they want to you know they want to have that greater level of involvement and you may not be used to this and you don't know how to how to not let the pendulum go too far where suddenly like everything is chaotic where you still have to move forward and i think that's a part where they where, where a lot of leaders struggle today is just how to get the best and how to strike the balance with all the different people they may be leading 
Yeah, one of the tools, that's a great point. One of the tools that I use for that, that I teach leaders um, is coaching. You mm-hmm. know, coaching is all about, if you can tap into a couple of basic coaching skills, you're good to go. The first coaching skill is listening, right? If you talk less and listen more, you're already head of the pack, right? And then if you ask really open-ended questions, my favorite tip is to ask questions that start with the word what, because they're very open-ended. You know, I think a lot of people, especially who are in left brain, tend to think in terms of why, but mm-hmm. if you shift it to what, it's, it's, it's very um, open-ended and less judgmental and very curious. And so that's what I share with a lot of leaders in that boat, John, is I'll say to them, well, just get curious with people, right? If they want to be involved, say, okay, what's important to you about being involved? Um, what impact do you think you can have? What are some of your ideas you'd like to share? Okay, then let, thank you for all of that. Now let me take it back and think about it. And I'm going to get back to you in a week and we'll talk about the next steps and what it's going to look like, but keep your commitments, then come back a week later and say, thanks for your input. And here's the plan. So I think there's ways to do that, that are really, uh, effective and collaborative. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's interesting you mentioned coaching because yeah, I, I I totally agree with you. But like most people have no clue how to coach, right? Most people's mm-hmm. most people their only real experience of coaching or maybe was in high school or school or wherever, and they're like, or they watch their they watch their favorite sports and they think a coach is somebody who like shouts and tells people what to do and they execute it. Um, and, and that's, and as you said, unfortunately, when people get promoted into positions, it's like, just do what I did. Okay. Here, just follow, just do what I did. No, you're not doing what I did. And, and that's the problem is people don't know how to coach. Yeah, that's true. I spend time in all of my programs with leaders, teaching them how to coach and even defining coaching, right? Yeah. So if you think about coaching, when you, you're a coach of a sports team, my, my son plays competitive basketball, he's 14, right? And it's very different. You know, if you um, speak at a turn, you're benched. If you know, if you mm-hmm. have yeah. too much swagger on the court, you're benched. Like the coach rules the roost, right? It's very different in the workplace. We're all adults. That's a, that's a, it's a different relationship, a 14 year old to an adult coach, right? Versus we're all adults in the workplace. You cannot treat anybody like that. Oh, they'll leave, mm-hmm. right? And so coaching is very much, yes, it's, it's the good thing about coaching is it's like a sport. You can learn how to coach. Um, you know, the first time you play tennis, for example, or any sport, it's, it's not easy. The first time I played tennis, I hit, you know, every ball went into the net and then over time you get better and better. Coaching is the same. Leadership is the same too. Leadership's a sport. The more you invest in developing your leadership skills, the more time you invest in developing your coaching skills, the better you'll become. And I like to use the expression, you know, once difficult, now easy, because I know a lot of leaders do struggle with coaching at the beginning, but it's like riding a bike. You know, think about Mm -hmm. when you were seven years old and you learned to ride a bike. It was hard. There was a lot to think about and manage. Coaching is kind of like that. But the more you do it, the more you practice, the easier it becomes. Yeah. And something else you just touched on there that uh, I often I often mention is investing in yourself because a lot of because you know a lot of people sit around and wait for the company to invest in them it's like oh you made me a you made me a manager okay well then i guess you're going to be giving me management training coaching and that may not happen so what i always say is how about you invest in yourself i mean the thing is you're probably i mean you just mentioned tennis earlier i bet you're investing in your hobby i bet you like to pay for lessons you do all of this what do you do to invest in the thing that puts bread on bread and butter on your table? I love that. I love that. Yeah. I mean, you're the CEO of your own career, so take charge. You know, I I think that's a great point. If you feel like there's a gap in your leadership capability, find a way to close that gap. It could be somebody in your office who's really good at doing that. For example, if you're one of your gaps is giving feedback. I know a lot of people avoid giving feedback, Find someone in the office who's really good at that. Ask, sit down with them. Say, can I meet you for coffee? Can we meet over Zoom? Can we talk about how do you do that? Is, is there a model you use? Go find yourself a feedback course. Go, you know, you you take charge of your career. I think that's a great point. And I think the other thing too the, uh, is that as leaders is like is you got to start looking at what people are best at. And could be because we come out of this, I think traditionally out of this whole mode of we're always trying to fix people and and yeah, you know, you're good at this, but these are the things you're not very good at. And I'm going to focus over here instead of going, 
I need to make you do more of what you're really good at. And I, I think this is a mental switch that people need to, to uh, leaders need to get to is like, stop trying to, stop trying to focus on what people are not good at, yes. focus on what they're good at and, and have them do more of that. Because, you know, number one, if they're not good at something, they're probably never going to be good at it and they're never going to like doing it. So what, what exactly are you achieving? Yeah, Marcus Buckingham first talked about that when he talked about leveraging your strengths. And he's got a whole string of assessments that you can use to leverage your strengths and take your team through that process. And it's true. It's funny when um, people often do development planning, they only focus on closing gaps on weaknesses instead of leveraging strengths. And I think that's the mm -hmm. best way to create a, a development plan for your team. Yes, there may be some, some weaknesses that you need to work on. But think about, I always say to leaders, when you're, when you're doing resource planning, um, that's why I like to use the DISC profile or some kind of a self-assessment mm -hmm. because it gives you insight into the different skills or, or Marcus Breckingham's um, strengths uh, assessment that he has available as well. Um, you know, if you, if you think about when you're doing resource planning, not the the individuals but the roles like what are the roles that you need what are the skills aligned with each of the roles and then think about which people need to go into that resource planning chart but a lot of people do it the other way they think yeah. about the people first and i really think you need to think about role and skill first no, I I I hundred percent agree with you, and I think you're right. That's why most people start most people start with the people um, rather than the role, and I, I and I totally agree with you. And I think the other thing too is where we need to get to with leaders need to make it more comfortable for employees to have the discussions about how, how about the work environment that works best for them and what i mean by that is as i said now we have you know you you maybe have virtual people we had somebody in our company who wanted to go to thailand for two months right continue to work project their work could be done project management they had all the access and everything and we were like yeah, okay makes sense to us work gets done but you need to have those conversations but you also need to have that flexibility and that mindset now of saying you know the, the traditional way of doing things is over and and if we're not a little bit more flexible while still getting what we need, people are going to go elsewhere. Oh, yeah, it's, it's so important. And the other thing is it's about motivation, right? And if you mm -hmm. think about what motivates you might be very different from what motivates someone yeah. else. And the reality is leaders put a lot of pressure. Like they say to me, okay, Vanessa, what do I need to do? I need to build a high performing team and get everyone motivated. And my answer might surprise you, but I always say to leaders, you can't motivate other people. Yeah. They yes. have to motivate themselves. Yes. And what you can do is you can create an environment that is motivating for them. And yeah. that comes back to your point around asking them, like, what is motivating for you? Because some, one person may be motivated by money. Someone else may be motivated by the ability to travel and work remotely for two months on a beach somewhere, which sounds yeah. really good to me. I know, doesn't it? <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> So we're all motivated by different things. Yeah. Yeah. And I, no, I don't love that. I, I love that bit about the the, the motivation because you're correct. Because I mean, you always go, "How do I motivate the team?" How? Well, you can't. They have to motivate themselves. But you're right. You got to create the the environment. And the only way is you going back to what you talked about earlier is by talking to people and then listening to them. That's how you're going to discover what their individual motivations really are. Because as you said, they may be completely surprising. Maybe for one person, as you said, it's the traveling. Maybe the other person wants to be in the office and wants a structured environment and all of that and and, and needs a lot more kind of interaction. I mean, people have, have, have different things. And that's why I think, as you said earlier, it's quite challenging for leaders because there's no there's no blueprint for any of this. Yes. And so because of that, one of the things that I tell leaders all the time is you don't need to have all the answers. You mm -hmm. do need to have the questions. And that's why coaching is so important. I don't know why leaders think I have to have the answers all the time. No, you don't. Right. But you do need to have the questions. Let's say there's a problem that needs to be solved in your team. You don't need to solve it alone. Bring your team together, have a meeting, say, okay, here's the focus of our meeting. By the end of the meeting, I want to resolve this client issue. Um, let's brainstorm ideas together and come up with a plan together. So two heads are better than one. Not only are you bringing your team in to solve the problem, you're having more 
you know, brainstorming is always more collaborative. You get more ideas, but also you're including your team in the problem solving process. So they're going to buy in because it's not just your idea that you're forcing upon them. That's one of the biggest issues why 70% of change fails is because organizations force change on people versus including them in the change management process. So you're including them in the process and they're going to, the ownership and the accountability is going to be there. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I totally, I totally agree with that. And, uh, and the other thing too is, I mean, I think that's a very traditional thing. As we grew up with leaders, you know, you felt like you needed, you know, you needed to know everything, or at least like, you know, uh, have have a handle on everything. But today, work is so complicated. I mean, there's new jobs coming on stream all the time. There's new requirements. It's impossible for you to sometimes even know anything about some of the things that may be going on in your work because you don't have the skill set, you don't have the insight into it. So you have to become, you have to rely on other people. And I think that's a mind shift change for maybe people who ha- have come from more traditional leadership backgrounds. And you're right. And it's in today's world of work, it's very common for people to lead teams and they have have not actually done that person's job. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the question I get from those leaders is, well, Vanessa, how am I going to direct this person when I've never done their job before? I get that all the time. And then you have to learn how to move people from developing to fully developed, right? You have to understand what are all their tasks? Where can you support them? Where can you find someone else in the business to support them? You don't need to be a subject matter expert in every role for the people who report to you. I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible actually, yeah. you know, many people, especially these days when people move around more, I would say in the old world, world of work where people were in a company for 10 years, you probably started at the bottom and worked yourself up yeah. and you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you had all those, you did all those roles yourself. It, it doesn't happen like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the byproduct of that used to be, here's how I did it. Here's how you will do it. <laughs> and now which is now it's the opposite because like i have no idea how to do that so i'm relying on you <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. it's so true yeah so listen vanessa this has been fun, fantastic all of vanessa's information will be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about you and mosaic sure so i'm a leadership consultant and coach my company is called mosaic people development I've been running my business for 11 years. I live in Toronto. I'm looking out my window and it's snowing today. (laughs) Um, I have two sons who are 14 and 16. So when I'm not consulting with my clients, I'm managing teenagers. So that's kind of fun. Um, And so that's essentially what keeps me busy, John. (laughs) Yeah. And there's no training for managing teenagers. Every every teenager is is a different, is different. Yes, they're all special snowflakes, aren't they? Yes, they are. They are. But their own I had to, personality. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly, and the and the teenage years are just fantastic. Uh, well, there you go. It's it is a fun time. It's a fun time. I have an eighteen year old son, so it's, uh, those those years are yeah. fun. So listen, thanks again, Vanessa. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Bye bye. Thanks, John. <laughs>